Yes. You're ready to go. Okay. Eight thirty two. All right, good morning. Uh, Eight thirty two on Tuesday, April twenty one. This is the regular meeting of the Town of New Canaan Board of Selectmen. Um, good morning, everyone. I'd like to start by uh, just having a brief moment of silence for our 21, perhaps now 22, uh, New Canaan victims of uh, this COVID uh, virus uh, or coronavirus. And um, I'd also like to note, as many of you know, that um, our own superintendent of schools, Dr. Brian Lutz, whose father passed away over the weekend after only four days of illness so of COVID. So. This is a very sad time, and I'd just like to take a few moments to re remember these victims. Thank you. Okay, first item on the agenda are the minutes of our prior last regular meeting on April 7. Do we have any comments or corrections on the minutes? Kit? Not here. I move that we approve the minutes as presented. Second here. All in favor, aye. Aye. Use hands, okay, thank you. Uh, actually, I haven't checked for comments yet. Um, we're, we're taking public comments um, by email and uh, have you see, seen any uh, public comments this morning? I haven't been able to check my email in the past 10 minutes. Have you seen any? If, if, if anybody's watching this on channel 79, uh, we'll, we'll extend the comment period <clears throat> uh, throughout the meeting uh, since this is a rather new process, but you can make comments about agenda topics um, if you provide, uh, well, you, you need to email them to bosdistribution at newcanonct.gov. That's BOS distribution, all one word, at newcanonct.gov. And we will read the comments uh, if we receive any. Okay, next item on the agenda is the appointment, uh, filling a vacancy on the police commission. Um, Shakiba Bennett was presented to us by the, uh, we actually got two candidates from uh, the Democratic Town Committee. And um, I think Kit knows Shakiba well, and uh, Nick and I both spoke to Shakiba. And um, uh, unfortunately, I guess we didn't invite Shakiba to be on this call, but um, uh, I'm very happy to nominate the first female member of the Canaan Police Commission. And um, as we did with the fire department with Beth Jones, and uh, I think it's about time in 2020 to have uh, broader representation on these boards and commissions. And um, so I moved the appointment of Chicago Bennett. Her resume Second. is on our tablets, but we know her well. And we uh, we're very happy to make this nomination. Um, do I have a second? Second. Uh, discussion? It's about time. <laughs> I, I think Shakeba will be a wonderful addition. She's really a, a balanced, fair thinker. She's got a lot of community knowledge and I just applaud this appointment. As I do. And um, I think she'll make a terrific uh, police commissioner. So with that, all in favor? Aye. That's your name, Tom. T Tiger, we'll move to public work contracts. Uh, Bill will be taking these. All right. Bill, Os uh, Bill Osman, um, building superintendent. We have various uh, routine maintenance contracts that we have to maintain our properties and our 
equipment. So, I'll start with the uh, first one is for the uh, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, preventive maintenance service. We did go out to bid. Um, we, we when we went out to bid, we had, um, I believe, in this case here, about five uh, contractors show up for the walkthrough. Um, only two um, submitted a um, proposal, and um, M.A. Garmello, who's been doing work for us for a number of years now, came in with the lower bid. Uh, all these contracts we went out for to try to have some uh, savings with time on these were all five-year contracts, and the contract is going to be written in a way that it's um, uh, before it's renewed every July 1st automatically, the funds would have to be approved through the budget process. Um, as long as the funding is approved, then the uh, contract will automatically roll into the next year. Um, so the first contract, as you see, is going to be for the total amount with contingencies of 281,242.50. Um, the first year being uh, 56,248.50. And also I had uh, labor rates also included in the bid so that when we do any additional work, once the PM is, uh, work is done, they discover something wrong, uh, we could do a time and material and we already have their, at least their rates for their time. I don't know if you have any questions. I have a question if I may. Um, since the world is changing, I'm wondering about going out for five-year bids at this time rather than one year. One year would be more, well, I don't necessarily think anything's going to change because labor rates are what they are. Um, that's not changing. Um, I'm having a hard enough time trying to get people to come bid projects, and I don't think um, I'm going to get a whole lot of... Uh, attraction with doing a one-year contract. It's difficult, a lot of these, because they are, like for preventive maintenance, it's only twice a year, um, so in some cases three times a year for the air conditioning equipment. It's nice to have a company come in who knows the equipment and then it rolls into next year. Um, to go through that learning curve every year is kind of difficult to get everybody out to all these buildings and you know, know exactly where everything is. But Bill, why wouldn't we do a two or three year contract? Well, we're looking for uh, the best savings in five years. We've seems been working. We've done uh, five years before. Um, you know, I'd have to rebid it. Um, I'm a little worried about going out to be rebid right now for timing and uh, for uh, well, we have to. again, again, people you know, require everybody to come back to our buildings. You know, it's the ideal thing to do right now, as you know. Um, I agree. You can you can certainly approve it for a year, two years, three years. We don't have to go the entire five. You can uh, certainly approve the contract for one or two or three. You don't have to go the full five. I, I don't I, I don't know. I'd have to look into that. Be honest with you, Tiger, first because the the bids were for five years, and their understanding was they did the discounting based on five years. So mm -hmm. I'd have to go back to the contractor and see if they're okay with doing a shorter term. We need to do this today. Can we do it in two weeks? No, you don't need to do it today. But are, are all, uh, they're all five years? They're all five-year, con yeah, they're all five-year contracts. Um, you know, this is one of the things we've been looking at with our advisory committee on buildings and infrastructure is to our procurement policies and practices. And uh, I'm not sure how I feel really about, you know, we, we may be going into a different, different economic world. Um, so, so I, my, my suggestion would be we actually, you know, take this up in two weeks. We can uh, discuss it among ourselves and see what. Uh, any That's reason fine. not to not to wait two weeks, Bill? Excuse me. Any reason not to wait two weeks? You can wait two weeks. I just want to make sure we have something in place before July one when uh, I need to uh, start the services up. Um. If I may, I'm also interested um, if we have these contracts that actually renew every year, are, is there any downside, any penalty whatsoever with not going forward? I'm not quite following the question. I mean, um, okay, you say this contract is subject to funding approval by the town for each year. Right. If the town doesn't approve the funding, is there any? Um, 
downside. Well, if you don't approve the funding, then the maintenance doesn't get done, period. Yeah, Kit, Kit we have to put that in the contracts because we can't do, you know, everything we do is subject to budgeting funding. Yeah, I just meant that, is there any penalty for that? Well, if the funding, well, the penalty would be on us, basically. If, if you didn't approve the funding annually in, in my operating budget, then those services could not be rendered by anybody. I so, understand that, but no, no. In, in, this, in this sense, this is an option. And so I'm wondering, is there a price for it? We'll check into that, kid. We don't believe there's a penalty for if you don't approve a, a funding line. And then we would have to then negate the contract. I don't believe that there's a penalty back from the contractor to the town, but we'll, re we'll review that as well. I, I also wonder, given this particular business environment, how many companies are gonna make it through? Who's gonna be around five years? E. Well, hopefully they all would be around and- uh, I hope so. You know, uh, this is helping. If we were to you know prove and get contracts going with these folks that they have, uh, they have something to look forward to and start doing. Yeah, Bill, when do we put these out to bid? Back in October, um, after last July, when we got the approval for this year, I was asked to go out to bid and have new new bids for the upcoming year. So when it was quite involved, went out in October, there was, um, you know, I had to have site visits from everybody, a lot of questions back and forth. And then uh, we received the bids and kind of leveled them all out now. And, getting ready to start the new year, we bought, we're going to bring them to you. Well, actually, actually the, this is the one that we're cleaning services. We, we actually got a worse contract than we expected because we went out to bid. Well, I don't know if it's considered worse. They, uh, there was out of uh, the four that showed up for the walkthrough, one never came back. The third one dropped out because they were received a contract for the new Norwalk Mall, so they couldn't handle the additional work. And it came down to the current contractor and a, another vendor, um, and the vendor in Darien who were looking to get approved uh, was highly qualified for the scope of the work and the size of the project. So it would be a new contract with that person. You got to keep in mind too that the minimum wage is going up every year for the next five years, uh, so that had to be calculated in also. Um, uh, am I mis am I misremembering that the uh, if have we gone back to our current cleaning contractor, they might have held their price or done better, and we actually did worse by going out to bid. Well, yes and no. I mean, um, they were struggling, and I've been you know beating them up pretty good on holding pricing. Um, they were looking to try to increase a lot of those uh, some of the pricing anyhow. Um, I guess bidding was a good thing to do to get everybody back on the right level playing field. Uh, could we have done better? You know, maybe. Um, we are having some, we're struggling with the current uh, cleaning contractor because they are, uh, uh, you know, they out, they, they're like, a, they're a franchisee, they franchise it out. So the local uh, ladies in Norwalk who bought into it do our, our properties. Um, they're looking for more money. And, and I feel that, it's at the point where the uh, service is starting to suffer a little bit because um, they feel everybody feels they need more money. So um, if I went and renegotiated the current contract to carry it, uh, I don't know how much difference it would make at this point. Um, they've been doing it for five years, I believe now. So maybe getting some new fresh talent in these buildings might be a good idea. Okay. Well, look at, I think this is a perfect example of why we're doing this review of our procurement and purchasing policies. And the plan is uh, at the next uh, uh, advisory committee meeting to review in detail the draft that Lund has prepared. I, I, we were gonna do it last meeting, but we really hadn't circulated for members to be able to do it. So we, um, we will uh, review that and then bring it back in May. No, I guess June, because um, it, it'll be a selectance policy like other towns have as opposed to a finance department guidelines. And uh, so actually we'll share that draft with you, with both of you, Kit and Nick, and um, you may want to watch the uh, advisory committee meeting on, I'm not sure when it's second, second Monday of May. And then we will, um, actually that'll be beyond two weeks from the, uh, from this uh, meeting. But I still think I'd like to take two weeks and kind of review these, I, I think, uh, Probably something in May for July one start is, is uh, yes, kid. Um, 
and I'm sure there's a rational uh, explanation for it, but when I was looking at the cleaning services, the percentage increase for each year seemed so much larger than, than the uh, supposed inflation rate. Except I'm just wondering what was the driver on that? Labor. But oh, is know, labor I mean, going up that much? Like it's going up, it's going up to fifteen dollars an hour over the next few years, and uh, so they had to reflect that. And I mean, I anyway. can't control what they put in for numbers. That's that's they did. They, both of them, uh, both contractors were you know close uh, with their numbers. Um, the current contractor. Um, he does our seasonal stuff and uh, he was off his target and we had problems with some of the numbers he was putting in. And I felt after discussing everything that we had to be very careful that uh, we weren't going to contract somebody who was going to gouge the price later, claim they can't do it. So I got, you know, it was very, a lot of discussions. That's why it took a little while to get to this point here with you folks. We had to have a lot of discussions about making sure we secure the right people. Okay, well, let's let's postpone this for two weeks. Uh, I, I'm I'm I'd like to discuss with Bill and Tiger the, you know, whether we would do a two or three year contract rather than five, and what the talk to the event vendors and see what that would mean. So um, let's. Uh, I don't I don't suppose we need to vote to postpone this, or I suppose we should. But actually, Tiger, I, I see Donnie on here. Are we do we are, do we intend to add an item to the agenda? No, there should have been recycling should have been on there. Be number, number five. Number five, recycling contract. Oh, not on my agenda. Tom, maybe I have the wrong. Yeah, we added, we added number five on uh, Friday. Yeah, th this is the quarter of four version on Friday. What time do we add it? About quarter after four. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a hour old draft from Friday. Okay, so we, uh, but anyway, I move we, we postpone the, uh, the, the uh, approvals for the public works contracts uh, until the next board of select meeting. Second? Second here. Okay, all, all in favor? Okay. Thank you. So we will go next to what's on the, the agenda, now that I have a new agenda, recycling contract. Tiger, or uh, Don? That'd be, that'd be Donnie, yep. Good morning. Good morning, Don. Uh, we put it out to bid again. Uh, four contractors picked it up. Two of them returned with uh, pricing, and the lowest price was Oak Ridge for 83.74 a ton to City Carding's 95 a ton. And the market's still not good. So could you give us a little more color on this? Um, well, the other towns are still paying, as of right now, Darien is the only town getting a rebate and it's part of their long-term contracts. Greenwich is starting to pay $65 a ton for the first time ever. And Wilton's still paying 65 without a contract and they're worried about, they don't know what the pricing is going to do at all because they don't have a contract. We so are doing, still, we are, we are doing slightly better than what are you know what going forward what we were paying city for this year so we are doing slightly better based upon the the number of pulls and the the, the quantity and the, and the pricing for that so we are doing better than what we were doing in july and august but we're worse than what we were doing in the previous year tiger remind Marcus. me of what are the what are the drivers of the pricing here the macro Driver, of drivers you have two different things you got a you got a pull cost and then you got a tonnage cost. So each time they pull one of the containers, there's a cost for that. And then the tonnage cost and the driver necessarily is still, there's not a market, you know, and, in, and while our materials might still be clean or better than most, it's going to a large scale MRF that they have to look at it as a, as a, as a product overall. So it's not a, it's not a question of what our, what we're giving them. It's a question of what they're getting from everyone and then having to find a market for it. And the market is still bad. Given given that uh, city carding, wasn't there an issue where they wouldn't even return our calls? Yes, 
And the general manager, the new general manager, apologized for all that. But, you know, I already told him the damage was done. And then they tried to negotiate after the fact when we put it back out to bid again. And I said, no, it's, we put it out. So that's public now that they have to go out and bid with the rest of them. And as it turns out, they weren't the low anyways. It turns out no, they still came up $12 bid. higher. Do we have reason to believe that Oak Ridge Waste will be more responsive? Um, it's possible they're willing to work on other things too as we go along. So we just got to get them in here because they have, they have a big plant in Shelton and in Danbury. They're probably the second biggest one in the area. What is the city of Danbury? Does the city of Danbury use them? Yes. What do they yeah, do? They pretty much, they pretty much have that whole area locked up up there. Where is City Cardi in Bridge Bridgeport? Uh, Stanford. Any further questions for Tiger or Donnie? If not, I'll move that we approve a uh, request from the Department of Public Works to enter into a two-year contract with Oak Ridge Waste and Recycling in Danbury for an estimated $214,818 per year for the hauling of recyclables. Um, <clears throat> do I have a second? Second, yeah. Discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Okay. I want, actually, Thank Donnie. Uh, yes. I ask that you come back to us on the uh, transfer station fee change and whether or not we should consider a, a, a senior. Did we get the information? Uh, yeah, the only town right now that's doing is Darien gives a discount to their residents for seniors. How many how many towns did we check with? Uh, I checked Darien, Wilton, Westport, Weston, Richfield. So okay, so senior a senior discount is not prevalent. Darien is the only, but Darien also also has one hundred and twenty five or hundred. What's the annual fee for Darien? One twenty five. One twenty. One twenty. One twenty. Yeah, it went down one twenty. So, you know, keep in mind, many seniors are in, are in congregate areas where they have uh, contra contractual services with their uh, rent, such as, uh, well, all the apartment buildings and all the uh, condos and co-ops. So there'll be some seniors, obviously. Uh, but anyway, I, we're not going to bring forth a recommendation on a senior discount. One resident suggested that, and um, I asked Donnie to, to uh, inquire what other towns are doing. We're still pretty low. Um, if anybody uh, has a hauling contract, they'll, they'll continue to pay $45. If they don't have a hauling contract and they pretty much use, they, they use the uh, transfer station exclusively to bring their trash to, they, uh, they're paying uh, 75, they'll pay $75. So we've already published it in the newspaper, uh, Tom, have we? Tom? Tom Stadler? Yes, I believe that's been published, yes. You've already published it, so. I think we, we still haven't taken up the parking fees because we don't know how to adjust them yet, but we will, we'll take that up. I'm not sure there's any other fees outstanding that we have to act on before the new fiscal year starts, but uh, parking permits. And to some extent, the uh, parking fees for meters and stuff because of the state's the tax on parking. Okay, so with that, we'll move up to the next item, which um, just a brief discussion about the tax programs. Linda, do you want to just give a brief summary? And, you know, this is a decision for the town council on Wednesday night, tomorrow night. Uh, just a brief discussion. Uh, sure. I think, I think Nick and Kit have both been following this, and uh, there's been several meetings where it's been discussed. Okay. Um, so basically, you have the memo that I shared um, to the town, to the town council. Uh, the town council has um, until April 25th to make a, um, to choose between the two options, between the tax deferment and the low interest program. Um, I included in those memos some comparisons. I took an example of a $20,000 tax bill um, paid biannually, what that would be um, under the current plan with before the executive order what it would be with a deferment program and what it would be if we went the low interest route. So I highlighted those just as an example. And then below I did some 
just initial projections of um, of cash flow, where and uh, where the money comes from, and how we would how the funds would flow if we were to do any of these uh, any of these programs. From a cash flow perspective, it doesn't make a huge difference to the town whether we go the deferment route or the low interest route, uh, because of the amount level of reserves that the town has. Uh, we will be able to sustain either one of those two options. And so the choice for the town council is just uh, which of those choices do they think uh, provides uh, the most relief to the, to, to the citizens. And then the choice for the town council also is uh, should they require documentation of people being impacted uh, by COVID. Um, some towns have gone the document requiring documentation um, some towns have gone to just fill out a form and say yes, um, and, and that's sufficient. And some towns have just uh, made it a blanket to every citizen who wishes to take part without asking them to provide any documentation. And so that's kind of a nutshell where things are. Uh, Kevin and I reviewed this. Um, the recommendation we put forward is for the town to go with, um, with a deferment option. Um, and, and, um, and a representation um, actually, it's targeted toward two levels. Uh, if you're an individual taxpayer, you have to represent that you have been affected, your income has been affected, is down 20% or more. And for commercial business, you have to represent that you're, you've been affected by the COVID crisis and your income is down 30% or more. So, so, it's, a so it's a representation of warranty without documentation. It's just, I represent right. X, Y, Z. Right. The, the, on the governor's calls, you know, the, the, the staff of the budget office up there has been saying they don't, um, they think people should just take taxpayers word for a representation. I, I'm, I understand from conversations with Wilt and Darianne that they're going to ask for a backup document and warn people that the information is subject to FOIA, which I'm not even sure it is, but um, I, I personally don't think it's necessary to have our taxpayers provide backup documentation. Uh, but that's something, it's, it's actually not our decision. Uh, Todd right. Labieri uh, joined us uh, in, in terms of making this recommendation. So it's not ju just Linda and me. And um, uh, the town council will be taking it up tomorrow night. Right. Well, you know, Kevin, I, I agree with that way forward. I think, um, you know, backup documentation, I think is ridiculous. Okay, so actually, I, I just like to ask, who is 203-817-1278? That's Mike, I think. Mike Dinan? I think so, yeah. Okay, no one from the advertiser right here? I suppose you can be watching 79, okay. Um, so... With that, that was just intended to be a brief discussion and have us, I don't think it's necessary for us to make a recommendation to the town council unless you feel you want to. Kevin? Did I jump over the yes. uh, rent relief? Actually, so. <laughs> we'll go back to it. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> do, I mean, do you want to? Do you want to make a recommendation to, to the town council? Yeah, I don't, you know, it's interesting in other towns because of the governor's order, this would be a recommendation by the board of finance to the board of selectmen. But since we have a, uh, a legislative body that can meet, um, uh, it, it, it's a legislative body decision and um, other towns. And I, I think there's some ambiguity here because if you have a town, the governor's order was intended to avoid having to have a town meeting where everybody shows up to approve a budget. Some towns like Darien and Greenwich and I'm not sure about Westport have representative town meetings. And I understand there's gonna be, a, they have a hundred members down in Darien. They're gonna have a virtual meeting to approve it. So, um, but our, our role in this, because of the fact that we have a 12 member town council is we don't have a, we don't have a vote. And I'm not sure it makes sense for us to make a recommendation to the town council, unless you want to. I'm I, good I, didn't, with that. I didn't. I didn't tee it up as a voting matter, but we can. 
just a regular. I, I'm meeting. good. I'm good without it as well, uh, Kit. Um, and but I, I, I do think this is the right way forward, Kevin. Having a, you know, tax deferral without documentation. Okay, Kit. Yes. So, on that, on that, I would actually like to bet. First of all, um, where's our budget discussion on the agenda? I guess we, we should have amended the agenda to add a budget discussion. We can bring it up later. We can bring it up at the end with your om, omnibus uh, discussion. Okay. 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 Very good. So let's go back to rent relief. Um, I, uh, you know, but there's been a lot of discussion in town about what can be done to help our local taxpayers and especially our downtown merchants. And um, as you know, we're, we're, we are a landlord for several town owned properties and um, there's a list on your tablets of uh, several uh, tenants, such as um, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and Earth Gardens and New Canaan Cares, which are in the Playhouse, upstairs in the Playhouse, <clears throat> or I'm, I'm sorry, the lower level for Earth Gardens. <clears throat> and um, the, uh, in the Town Hall Annex upstairs is the New Canaan, New England Academy of Dance. And um, I don't know, what is time to shine? Time to shine is, is the um, hey, Linda or Tom to, to, to watch shop over the train station. Yeah. Oh, well, that's closed. So actually, the other, um, and then um, <clears throat> on the tablets there were two actual mistakes. One, there is no property lease with the New Canaan Library. There's some data lines and things that um, they reimburse us for, and um, and then. Uh, Waving the Care Center and Bankwell. Waving the Care is due in June, and I think we ought to have a discussion with Waving the Care Center. They have a rather modest um, annual rent that um, has been in effect for the 40, 50 years, 47 years. Um, it has been adjusted in the past, but, um, and then Bankwell pays twice a year and their payment is, is, is due, but I think we ought to have discussions directly with those institutions because they're much larger and it's not a monthly rent. But my, my proposal would be to show that the town wants to help our downtown merchants and our, our nonprofits especially by having a, a, a moratorium on rent for, for 90 days for April through June. Actually, I, I think I'd make it through the July 1 payment. Um, we didn't catch April, so... Um, we have heard from uh, both the New England Academy of Dance and from Bowtie Cinemas. Uh, Bowtie Cinemas actually sent us a lawyer's letter uh, asking whether or not um, we're taking the position that the force majeure clause um, comes into play. And we don't agree with that necessarily, but I, I don't think we need to uh, debate that with them. And I think we ought to be generous. They have no revenues, they're closed, and it's, it's not quite fair to be charging rent for space in a, in a time like of crisis. We want these these tenants to be in business uh, four months or six months or now. And um, so, you know, we are going to give up some modest amounts of revenue. Um, but I think, uh, I think it's the right thing to do. And it's also, I'd like to, you know, show our community our landlords that they need to perhaps uh, look at giving some moratorium relief to their tenants because uh, we want to preserve our merchants and our nonprofits in town and anything that can be done to help um, consistent with their obligations to bank lenders, et cetera, that they ought to try to do as well. So um, uh, before I make a motion, I mean, do you have any questions or do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, Kevin, I agree with this. Um, just to be clear for everybody, this is not a rent deferral. This is a rent abatement for those two or three months. Well, I should get, uh, uh, Nick, I, I, I use the word moratorium for a reason. It really doesn't, I'm not waive, we're not going to waive the rent. We will discuss it um, in 90 days and see if, uh, you know, chances are we'll probably uh, defer it further. But I, I don't want to necessarily say we're, we're wa waiving the rent. But moratorium means you're just waiting to uh, the situation changes and then you'll, you'll discuss it. So I, 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 I I, I debated actually whether to uh, suggest we waive it entirely, <clears throat> but um, I think um, a moratorium is, is sending the right message. And I think especially for private landlords, 
they may very well want to do a moratorium and try to work out things in the future. Uh, you know, people have made the point that the governor doesn't have the authority to, to, uh, to uh, uh, order that uh, private contracts be breached. Um, and um, therefore, we want to be as, as friendly and, and supportive as possible to our nonprofits and our, and I think private, private landlords should, should try to do the same. But it, it, we, we may decide, and that's really <clears throat> a decision 90 days down the road or more to decide whether we in fact forgive or waive the, uh, the rent payments. But for now, I would suggest we simply adopt a 90 day moratorium, which would include the July 1 payment. So if April's already been paid, we really don't have the ability to, uh, to help with April. Um, but we certainly in May and June and July, we could uh, give them 90 days relief. Yeah, to be clear, I am completely supportive of this. And I think the message that it sends is, is as important, if not more important than, than the money issue. Um, I guess the only question I have is, you know, from one lawyer to another, do you, do we intend to try and memorialize this moratorium? Or we, yeah, we'll, or, or we, yeah. well, we'll, we'll communicate with each tenant that we, you know, we, we approved a moratorium for 90 days and, and we'll talk about it in 90 days. I'm not, I don't expect if things are uh, more than likely we'll enter into some terms um, for the future. We're not going to say, you know, you owe it now in 90 days. We'll, we'll, we'll look at it. Right. And, but I, it re really requires um, some individual discussions with individual tenants and what they're able to do in the future. And, and we may, you know, decide by the end of June that we'll simply, uh, consistent with talking to the Board of Finance, um, decide to forgive it altogether. But we, you know, that's for that's for a discussion down the road. Right. And you've di you've discussed all of this with outside counsel, correct? Yes. Okay. And I think it's the right thing to do. There's a lot of pain out there, and uh, anything we can do to help is what we should be doing. Right. So I move we adopt a moratorium on rent for these particular. Um, uh, tenants that are on the tablets and um, the ones on the top. Again, I, I would have it since the, since the uh, waiving care center payment is not due until June and since it's a uh, annual payment, I think that's correct, Tom. It's just one payment a year. I think so, yeah. Uh, the, you, we can have a discussion with waiving the care. Obviously, anything we can do to help waiving the care uh, would be desirable. And then Bankwell, as a, as a relatively big bank with a balance sheet that keeps, keeps on earning regardless of whether or not they, uh, that I'm not sure what their attitude is about paying their April payment. They haven't made it yet, but I, I don't plan to uh, be unfriendly to Bankwell. And um, we'll see what, what a conversation with them produces. And uh, uh, But anyway, so the moratorium would apply for now uh, to um, the smaller nonprofits and Bowtie Cinemas and the New England Dance Academy. I, I, second I, motion. I, I moved that we have a 90 day moratorium as, as I've described it. Second? Second here. Further discussion? No. Okay. All in favor? Okay, moving on then to um, uh, on our tablets, our legal fees. And I noticed we are considerably under our budget, which will help with the overall budget. Um, but any questions on the legal fees on our tablet? I think um, we are currently through March. Or I guess that's through. It. Um, this bill is through April 6th. We are at 168,523 for the year. This is down considerably because we have had less planning and zoning conflicts. We've had less, uh, we don't have labor negotiations going on. So we're considerably under budget um, coming into the fourth quarter. Any questions on the legal fees? No. I move, we approve them. Second? Second. Okay, all discussion? All in favor? Legal fees are approved. Thank you. Contracts under $5,000, there's a few four or five contracts under $5,000. Any questions about those items? I might mention here that we've been having 
uh, and we'll talk about it on the budget discussion. Um, we've been uh, incurring maybe $80,000 to date of COVID related expenses, which we hope will be reimbursable by FEMA. I have a department managers meeting at 9.30. I'm gonna ask the department managers to, uh, to document uh, their 10 largest COVID related expenses and the explanation of them. This is sort of an audit so that we'll be prepared uh, to make sure everyone's on the same page as to what they're recording so that we have documentation ready to make a FEMA claim. So I would, Tom, I'd ask that uh, we ask the department managers to send to you um, their top 10 uh, from March 15 to April 15. And um, uh, that's a, a budget note. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So um, moving to general matters. I actually probably should have uh, suggested we add to the to the agenda. I'll be happy to talk about anything you want to, but um, um, uh, as you, did either one of you check in last night to the town council finance committee meeting? They had a two and a half hour meeting last night. We covered a number of subjects. Um, there is a lot of concern that we cut back spending both on the town council and the board of finance. And um, so at the town, at the, uh, Lunda has prepared a uh, draft expenditure budget and, and uh, revenues budget through April 16. Um, it's unusual we do mid month financials. And so it's a good bit of work to get the department managers to make estimates through June, um, both with respect to uh, revenues and uh, expenses. Uh, I plan to uh, talk to each of the department managers um, about their, uh, Linda, do you want to sort of give a brief summary of what this represents and then we can discuss it further? Sure. So, so what we did is we looked at on the operating budget side, um, looked at where year to date was, we did this in mid April. Uh, but I sent out to departments uh, their line item revenues and their line item expenditure lines and to just kind of give us a sense of where they think uh, they'll end um, at the end of the year. Obviously, with, with some of the buildings being closed, uh, there's some things that we're not going to spend on. Uh, there's some programs, for example, in recreation uh, that are not going to take place and therefore expenses related to those programs like the part-time help uh, those expenses go away. But likewise, some of those programs bring, bring in revenues and therefore the revenues that's associated with, these, with those programs also uh, go away. Uh, we looked at our uh, property tax revenues, which is our biggest uh, revenue source to kind of see where, where those are. Um, so we looked at that where it was as of mid-April. Um, I talked to Roseanne to see how much of the taxes were, were outstanding. Um, and did a preliminary projection on those. Obviously, these numbers will, these projections will change as we get closer to the end of the year. They become more and more refined. Um, at this point, with 12 weeks out almost before the end of the year, it's difficult to know. Um, I asked also the Board of Ed to kind of provide uh, their numbers to see where they thought uh, they would end the year. Uh, given the school closures, but also the additional expenses uh, related to the e-learning and, and, and so forth. And so that they provided some of those estimates. So that's what you have um, in front of you. Uh, again, these are, uh, are preliminary numbers, but it's just an attempt to kind of see where, where things are. Uh, the big unknown and what I, we've started to separate um, in the draft, in the preliminary document that you have, uh, if you, on the numbered one that I sent late last night, um, on page nine, uh, we, we itemized um, COVID expenses. Uh, we created these COVID accounts uh, for each department and we asked each department to start tracking those COVID expenses and we're charging them to those accounts. And so we did a uh, year to date where we were in those accounts and also to kind of estimate where we'll be. As you know, it's, it's really difficult to know uh, for expenses like COVID uh, because we don't know what the demands are on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, you've, if you're in on those calls with Mike Handler, there's discussions about uh, possibly for some of our public works, 
um, employees, under emergency workers, if it gets to the point where we may have to contain them in hotels so that they don't go home and spread the germs to their families um, and so forth. And so that's a big unknown. Uh, we haven't pulled that trigger, but we do, have, uh, we do have a hotel on standby should we need to do so. Uh, but you may be looking at uh, booking a, a block of rooms for an extended period of time to house some of our employees. Uh, that may happen, that may not happen. It's, it's very difficult to project uh, something like that. And so, so what you have in front of you is kind of a best uh, guess at this time as to what that will be. Uh, for the Board of Finance, at the last meeting we had, we did not have March financials then. Uh, they've asked that we do, uh, we include April financials, which we will, and therefore we'll do another, another look at this um, for the May meeting of the Board of Finance, which will include spending as of um, the end of April, and uh, those will be reconciled numbers with the Board of Ed. Uh, an interesting piece of this also is that we also sent um, tax uh, statements, uh, delinquent statements go out in April, um, and those have gone out. And so hopefully by the end of April, we'll also get a better read on where we expect to end uh, as far as tax revenues, which is our biggest revenue driver. And obviously- hey, Linda, Linda, on, yes. on the delinquencies, has there been an uptick in the number of delinquencies? No, uh, Ro sent me a number uh, sent me her sheet um, today and last year when we sent the April delinquencies we had about 1.4 million dollars um, that was delinquent. Uh, this year's April statements are actually 1.2 so it's actually down 200 year over year um, and so so yeah so in terms of uh, where we are in terms of property tax revenues for this fiscal year we're pretty close to what we've, we, where we would be, just because on the cycles, we typically get rents, uh, tax revenues in June, July, and then January. And so by the time when COVID hit, most of those obligations as far as property taxes right. were people had committed to them. And so it does not impact um, to that extent our revenue. So I think for yeah. the year in terms of revenue impacts on the tax revenue, it's gonna be minimal. The biggest hit we're seeing on revenues is on um, building permits. This was something that we had been watching even before COVID, if you recall, in some of the sessions I've done with the Board of Finance. Uh, but right now, um, Brian is projecting that number. He's, e he's downgraded the, the revenue projections on that. We had a budget of 900,000. Right now we're projecting possibly 600 um, in total building permits, just based on what he knows. Again, we'll keep refining this. And then the other one is the um, conveyance fees. This is one where we had begun to see downward trends even last year, and it was trending downwards this year. Uh, but projecting it towards for the year end, uh, we're also projecting to be slightly down this year than we were than we were last year. Um, and so, to the extent that we over collect in years. Uh, that overcollection is having to make up for some of these downfalls in these other big ticket items. Where in previous years, we would overcollect in property taxes because of the collection rate, but we would also be close to budget on building permits and conveyance fees. Uh, this year, we're seeing a downtick in those areas. And so that's eating up some of that um, additional revenues that we historically get from property taxes. Um, so you're dropping building permits from 900,000 to 600, right? As of now, yes. Um, I right. had discussion with Brian, that's what, that's what he's, he's estimating. And he did a, very, uh, a, real, uh, a really thorough job because he looked at the permits that are in place, the permits that are in progress. Um, he thinks it may go up, uh, but for now, that's the number he's comfortable with. We're gonna look at this again um, at the end of the month in May and revise, mm -hmm. revise that number. And, and for the record, conveyance fees are being dropped from a million two seventy five to a million. Right? Correct. Um, I actually had that number even lower than that, uh, but we're going to monitor it. But um, I talked to Claudia and just what she's seen in the town clerk's office, um, and, and she thinks let's put a million for now. But again, we'll look at it. We'll look at that year to date where things are by April. 
Uh, with the weather, as it gets warmer, you typically have a bit more uh, property exchanges uh, in the winter time. That's just kind of how it's trended historically. So we'll see again in May how that looks. Hey, so Linda, in the COVID expenditures, we've got a line item for other, it's the last line item in, in the block, other COVID-19 non-salary yes. expenses for 100,000. What, what is that comprised of? Um, <laughs> that's just my dart in the dark. Um, I don't know. As I mentioned, we talked about hotel rooms. Um, you saw in the paper, uh, the fire chief says that he's anticipating 30,000 in overtime. Uh, those numbers, if you'll see, they're not in those numbers. If you look at the fire line, right. you don't capture that 30,000. And so that will absorb some of those um, expenses that, that we don't yet know. And so, you know, we may well be under that. Or, but, but yeah, but that's we a expect, placeholder for now. Oh, we, we expect hopefully that FEMA will reimburse legitimate and, oh, COVID sorry. expenses. Right. Uh, to 70, uh, has there been any movement on the 75 versus 100 percent? The governor no, New York State the, has 100 percent. The governor Lamont has, I think they call it, um, I think the technical word is appeal. Um, and so he's put that in and we haven't heard back um, to get 100 as opposed to the 75. But the reimbursements we get from these will be reflected. They'll probably come next fiscal year possibly, and Bill can say more on the timeline because he's been through this before, but these would be additional revenues in the following year's budget that we didn't budget for uh, because we don't have FEMA reimbursements in the next fiscal year budget. So that's when we'll see the, the revenues come in. Yeah, Nick, you may recall with the Storm Sandy, we had $400,000 of reimbursement from FEMA. Right. Can I just uh, add, uh, this, uh, this FEMA event is gonna require us to file quarterly so that they can get payments out quarterly. When I say quarterly, if I file quarterly, maybe uh, the next quarter payments may start coming in. Um, I'm working through that now with FEMA and uh, um, and tracking. So uh, yeah, that's why that's why I want to audit these uh, first month from March 15th. I, I, I'm not sure when the the uh, FEMA order came, presidential order came week. down, but uh, up to April 15th, and then we'll we'll see. You know, make sure everybody's on the same page as to what they're calling COVID expenses. Right. And uh, well, Tom Stadler, I'd like you to do that with Bill Osman and Linda, and so we can have a handle on that. As far as the uh, as it, uh, the uh, department managers meeting has been moved to ten o'clock, so um, but these are these are just estimates. This is not a budget. This is um, something the town, the board of finance um, uh, asked us to look at. In my view, the the town the board of selectmen manages the budget once it's been approved. As I told the town council. Uh, when they approve the budget for next year, uh, a budget is a authorization to spend. It's not a mandate to spend. And there's a lot of sentiment, um, especially on the town council, but also among many members of the Board of Finance, that we need to cut back drastically. Um, I think Stanford is seeing a, a, a significant shortfall in revenues and plans to cut spending uh, significantly. Um, so what I plan to do is um, also ask the... Uh, Department managers at our meeting today to give me a listing of the top 10 capital projects by date of priority. And uh, so we can make some decisions now and now wait until the Board of Finance meets in uh, whenever they meet in May. Um, and I, I indicated to both the Board of Finance and the Town Council that we'll take all the advice they want to give us, but these are decisions for the Board of Selectmen on the budget because we now manage the budget for the rest of this year and, and, and the budget coming into play for July 1. Uh, so that being said, um, do you want to talk about other topics? Well, you know, getting back to <clears throat> budget and, and um, unusual circumstances, Linda, I know you weren't in, in town then, but um, I think Kevin and I had discussed maybe you were going to go back and see what happened in 2008 as an indicator um, of what we might be able to do now. Um, well, actually, Linda surprised, went back 20 years on our tax receipts and Linda, awesome. why don't you summarize what that 20 year history <laughs> showed us. Even better. <laughs> yes, so what, what I did was I did a 20 year look back at property tax revenues, which covered the, the, down, the downturn in 01 and also the downturn in 08, 09. Um, as far as our property tax revenues, they actually, in all of the in all of that twenty-year 
time period exceeded 99%. Um, I think the dip we got, it was in, I think it was after the 08 reception in 08, but then a lot of that was recaptured that following year. Uh, when you say dip, prior year taxes. What, uh, what was the dip? What was the nature of the dip? Dip means um, we went from a 99% in excess of 99% collection rate. And I think that year we dropped to 98.8 or 98.7. Um, and so it, it wasn't significant at all. And so what I did was I averaged the entire time period um, and we were, we're still at like 99.5% collection rate in a, on a 20 year average. But even those, like I said, even that small dip, that half a percent dip in that year we caught up with that in that following year because those people that were delinquent or that didn't pay, paid up the following year. So we were made whole within those two years, the full complement of taxes were paid. It was just delayed receipts. How do we think this crisis is different than the past 20 years? If um, and, and, and we don't know uh, just because when, when this particular um, crisis hit, we were already kind of past the tax collections for the prior year. And so this year is not an in, a good indicator. What we would like to see, what will, what will be the telling sign will be July and August. Um, I think two things we'll know at that point is because the executive order um, exempts uh, escrowed um, accounts from the delay. However, it did say on there, if, uh, if a borrower showed that they've been um, impacted by COVID between them and the borrower, and they were, there were some arrangements on their taxes, those payments could be delayed to the town. And so we will know by mid-July the level of escrow revenues that we get, if that stays consistent or if there's a number of property owners um, that are impacted even with their escrow. So that'll be the first indicator. I think the second indicator will be how many of our taxpayers um, take advantage of whatever plan the town council puts forward uh, because it's not, a, it's not mandatory. Um, you know, we've estimated 25% of residents will, will just continue to pay um, as usual and not necessarily take the delay, but, but we'll see. And I think those will be. Yeah, Linda, 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 we didn't estimate. We guesstimated. We guessed. We, <clears> guessed we have no <throat> idea. We have no we have idea. No idea. Yeah. Um, and so but, that's when we'll know. I, but I sort of we'll the worst, worst case, worst case is the 75% of the non escrow people don't pay their taxes in July. Uh, I, think, I think that's probably, a, Linda wanted to use the 10% or 90%, which I thought was kind of crazy. So it's, it's a guess. So, so with respect to the escrowed accounts, in order for there to be a deviation from that contractually negotiated arrangement between mortgagor and mortgagee, there has to be, they have to go to the bank and say, hey, I want to change this or yeah i i think i think banks don't generally uh agree to that uh, i right. think the uh the, the taxes have already been collected in the first six months of this year for the july payment so right. i don't i think I, my guess is the banks will almost universally pay everything that's that's escrowed they, if there's been an arrangement it may be for the month of uh may and, and june or possibly april in which case we'll get not the full amount but, but i think escrow agents will turn over what they have for the six months prior to July one, and that's twenty two million dollars. If, if uh, there was no decrement in that, and um, on top of our uh, what we estimate to be maybe a twenty eight, twenty nine million dollar general fund balance at the end of June, we're, we're coming into this crisis with a very healthy general fund balance, right. which quite honestly is the the reason that the town council, uh, uh, you know, rich rich council would give give back ten million dollars rather than five million dollars to the taxpayer for the. Which, which I don't think the, the Board of Finance would uh, agree with, but um, there's a lot of sentiment to uh, be more generous to our taxpayers this year when they need it. And so I'm, I'm in favor of that. Anything we can do to, uh, to lower our mill rate and um, help our taxpayers this year, we ought to be generous. But Luna, what percentage of the, um, the mortgages in town are escrow? Do we know that? About 30, 32 to 35%. Mm -hmm. You know, there's also another factor here that we haven't heard about yet, but the federal government has given the state of Connecticut $1.5 billion as part of the CARES Act, and they intend to distribute that down to the cities and towns to some extent. They are, the state also has a $2.8 billion rainy day fund, 
So I will. I, I suspect what we're going to hear soon is that the uh, state is sending down money mainly to the cities uh, uh, to help with their their budgets and their. And I, I, from what I've seen in the news, they're they're talking about any further reliefs to be more aid to the states and municipalities. So, um, again, fortunately, uh, we come into this crisis with a much more healthy general fund balance and, and can afford to to be more generous. So, what are you thinking from a budgetary standpoint going forward, Kevin, in terms of cutting costs? I'm not even thinking about July yet. I, I, you know, I think how we look at the world in mid-May versus mid-June will be a lot different. And um, but for now, we have to think about what we can do in the next 70 days. Um, and uh, and we, you know, actually, you know, the, the numbers here, London. What's the Board of Education estimate for their savings in the? Um, in this pro forma is 750,000. When I talked to Dr. Lutzi and Dr. Keating, they were saying possibly anywhere between 650 to a million. But again, these are guesstimates. And right. where are those and savings also, coming from? I did not get the line item um, information, but we could, we could definitely ask. Um, I think we should ask. Not that we have much control over it, but on the other hand, it's nice to see that that larger number. On the town side, we have um, right. significant estimated savings, but I would note too, <clears throat> you know, we probably in an ordinary year would have come out this year with a million and a half to $2 million um, over collection of revenues and over budget, un under budget spending as we did last year. Was the number last year $2 million on the town side, Linda? 2.9 million the year before? And, mm, uh, yeah, close to that. And um, you know we're not going to we're not going to have that full savings this year because we have to make up for a uh, a uh, error we made in not budgeting for the library's uh, health insurance for two years this year and last year so that's almost a million dollars altogether so um, the final the final general fund balance will reflect that um, making up that million dollar uh, unbudgeted number for health care for the library for two years. Right. So I, I would make a few remarks about the uh, great work that our emergency operations team is doing, um, not only with respect to protecting our first responders and also um, helping our residents when they're in need for this uh, uh, getting to the hospital. And um, uh, we are um, have a terrific uh, grocery shopping program for our seniors. Ironically, back in January, when we created a survey of our seniors for the uh, Human Services uh, Department to understand what services we provide to our seniors, we have a database that has been very useful to know exactly which, which seniors live where. Um, and we've been able to target meals. Um, the school district is preparing meals daily now for um, 150 students. Actually, did they just extend it to uh, younger people as well, K, K through four? And they also, Cheryl? And they, and they um, we're, we're delivering meals to certain selected uh, congregants, uh, school, like for example, schoolhouse apartments. Um, they, the school district took over the Meals on Wheels program last week because uh, the Meals on Wheels is primarily senior volunteers who deliver the meals. So the school district has really kicked in with their support for the town. Um, and um, we also have purchased, I think, uh, 29,000 masks, surgical masks, and we are, um, in the process, of, surprisingly, FEMA has a program that, that if you ask your state emergency uh, regional coordinator to uh, have FEMA deliver masks to cloth masks to uh, residents, they will have them delivered. We hope they are good with their word that they'll deliver by the end of the week cloth masks to all of our residents. I'll believe it when I see it, <laughs> but I, but they say they will. And in the meantime, we are trying to figure out how to distribute 29,000 um, surgical masks to our residents and. We are either going to have the U.S. Postal Service do it, which has been a huge night, red tape nightmare to try to get approval, or we probably will have a, uh, a point uh, where people can pick them up uh, someplace downtown, such as Saks Middle School. That is still in the works. Um, 
So between the support we've given our seniors and the uh, the support our first responders have got, you may have seen the report about we're trying to honor a tradition that the schools have to um, have birthday celebrations for um, fifth and sixth graders. Um, that we're uh, we're doing that with our emergency our first responders uh, driving by people's homes and um, uh, the um, there's a lot of talk about um, next steps. Uh, I've had conversations with Tucker Murphy about the chamber creating some kind of business advisory group that would help us uh, through the uh, process of reopening, especially the downtown New Canaan. And uh, uh, I don't want it to be a town committee per se, but I'd like, I'd like to see a private sector group do that. And um, what else? Any questions about the COVID response? I, I yeah, with that. respect. Oh, go ahead, Kim. You go ahead, Nick. I was just going to say that uh, yeah. such a. <laughs> go ahead, Nick. Ladies first. I was just going to say that it's uh, a remarkable time to be a resident in New Canaan, because uh, I cannot imagine um, a better, more thought-filled, heartfelt response than than we're receiving here. Agree. Agree. And Kevin, I'd like to, you know, mention you. Um, I don't think if any first selectman in this town's history has had to go through what you've gone through. And um, we were on top, you were on top of this early. Um, we were one of the first towns to kind of close things up. We closed the parks, we closed the restaurants, obviously curbside de delivery excluded, but I think you've done a phenomenal job. You've been working 24 seven um, and you've done an amazing job. Um, and I thank you for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. So Maybe one I last thing I have is that um, I'm going to show this. That's the EMS numbers over the last uh, 15 years, which are, it's Nick VAC, which are, which are, which are going down. Uh, and I think there's a similar trend uh, amongst the fire volunteers. And uh, I know there's been some discussions in town about incentives to EMS and fire volunteers. And uh, I, you know, I'm very much in favor of exploring those incentives because uh, I, mean, I mean, my gosh, the, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that we save by having a volunteer Nick Vac uh, and, and a volunteer fire company to augment our paid people is, is, um, is, is really significant. So anything we can do to incentivize new members, uh, I think is a, is a good thing financially and also the right thing to do socially. I agree. Yeah. And if, unless we have anything further to discuss, I'd like to end on the note of thanking all our first responders, both the uh, Ambulance uh, Corps, which is, uh, does remarkable work in this kind of environment where you have to be very careful, uh, as all medical workers do, the police and the firemen, and, um, and also the people that work in the supermarkets and the, uh, the gas stations and the pharmacies. Uh, you know, there's a lot of heroes out there who are going to work every day and supporting people who, uh, uh, are potentially affected, infected, and this is a very, very dangerous, quickly spreading virus, and we've come through it relatively well when you compare ourselves to the other towns. The, uh, the seniors have obviously been usually impacted, especially the nursing homes, where um, unfortunately it's based on a business model where a number of workers um, work in multiple facilities and um, uh, can uh, early on perhaps uh, not be as as um, protective as they might be. And um, so there's been a number, I think the whole total number of seniors in nursing homes that have died uh, in Connecticut is 400 or so, uh, which is a real tragedy, but this is the kind of virus that it's very, very hard to uh, protect people. Um, and also I wanna give a shout out to uh, some amazing volunteers. Um, for example, Grace Farms who came, stepped up and bought $2.5 million of uh, protective equipment 
uh, and have we delivered through our, fi our volunteer firemen to I think 14 towns and cities, um, to the hospitals and the first responders, PPP, PPE, which wasn't available in the first few weeks of this crisis. And Grace Farms did a remarkable thing to facilitate that, uh, sourcing the uh, sourcing the materials from uh, out of the country. And uh, uh, without that, we probably would have more uh, Fairfield County exposure than we've had. So um, there's a lot of first responders and heroes to thank and to recognize. And I really, uh, I want to end with that note today. And our all of our town employees, you know, we've uh, been operating in, in absolutely remarkable circumstances to try to get through this. And I want to thank everybody for their dedication and hard work. And especially, as I said earlier, uh, Dr. Uh, Brian Lutze uh, has done a remarkable job with the Board of Education support, the school district support for the town. And I, my condolences again to Brian for his father, which is a tragedy. So. Anything further? Not here. Not here. With that, we will, I, I don't think we ever got any comments other than a couple of questions from the press. I, I don't want to leave anyone off. So did anyone get any emails that were comments from, uh, um, I don't think so. Um, anyway, for those watching on channel 79, um, uh, we wish you a good day, and at 9.43, we I make a motion to adjourn. Second here. Okay, thank you all. Stay safe, everybody.